thank you all for coming today. It's really wonderful to see such a huge turnout, and I hope you'll all be glad that you joined us. Let me begin by wishing everyone a Yom Yerushalayim Sameach. Today is the anniversary of the day 48 years ago, the third day of the Six Day War of 1967, when Israeli troops restored the old city of Yerushalayim to the Jewish people. We thank Hashem for this, and pray that it be among the many elements constituting Rajiv Hasmahabu Latinu, the first flowering of the redemption of the Jewish people. We're here today to address a concern that's pervasive among Jews of all stripes today. We may pray fervently to Hashem during crisis, in times of grief, of potential or recent loss, of ill health of ourselves or those close to us. We also pray to Him spontaneously when we're ecstatically happy, out of thanksgiving for the birth of a healthy child, wonderful success, or the turnaround of a difficult or sad period or illness. But let's face it, we're commanded to pray three times a day and to make for a hope throughout the day, regardless of our personal situation, when nothing much is happening other than the fact that we are alive and life goes on as usual. This poses a series of problems. First, while it might be possible to come up with heartfelt, spontaneous prayers at times of crisis or great joy, for the most part, we're expected at every service to recite page after page of prepared text built up over the centuries by our ancestors. When Yitzchak went out to meditate in the fields, he surely didn't have 75 pages to recite from the two-pound prayer book. Second, while we're blessed with that prayer book's many beautiful, meaningful prayers, it's well known, as we say in the Nishmat, that even if our mouths were as filled with poetry as the ocean is with water, we would still be unable to adequately thank Hashem for even one billionth of the favors He's bestowed on us in our people. And third, we are told that all these prayers, which have become as familiar to us as the Pledge of Allegiance and can be recited by rote, are to be said each time with full understanding and with our whole heart, with kavanah, focused intention. How can we truly pray with kavanah at every opportunity and serve Hashem with the feeling of simcha? Is it even possible to summon the appropriate mindset and engage in meaningful prayer from the set text multiple times a day? Is this something that can be taught? If so, is it the same for everyone, or are there many paths to it? And what roles do music and song play in achieving kavanah? Questions like these, and others you may have about prayer and the expectation of kavanah, are the genesis of today's workshop. I would like to credit my chavrusa, Aharon Shalom, for bringing these up and being willing to discuss many of them in our learning together, and for encouraging me to take steps to find others who are or have been struggling with these concerns, all with the intent to bring us together as we are today, to hear answers and suggestions from our leaders and other members of our community. I want to thank Rabbi Rosenbaum, who has been very supportive of the idea and helped me develop the program and select participants, including our keynote speaker, Rabbi Goldberger. My brother and I are sponsoring this program in memory of our dear parents. Our mom and dad, Alehem Shalom, in particular our father, Leonard Rosenthal, were people who always wanted their prayers to mean something to them and to Hashem. When I was growing up, I would be shocked to hear my dad, while he was getting dressed in the morning or just going about his daily routine, loudly and apparently randomly cry out passages from the daily service. When I was young, it always took me by surprise, and I asked my older brother, what's up with Dad? <laughs> Eventually, I came to see it as simply part of his ongoing conversation with Hashem, sort of like Tevis. I hope this program will represent an aliyah for his neshama and for my mom, Marlene Rosenthal, as well. We thank you for coming today and hope you will come away with new, new knowledge and practical suggestions that will improve your kavanah and make your daily prayers more meaningful. But more than that, I have a hidden agenda behind this program, and it's one that I know Rabbi Rosenbaum and Aaron share with me. We don't intend this to be just a one-off program. As much as we hope you get something out of being here today, we want this to be the start of an ongoing effort in the community. We envision a number of follow-ups, a weekly class in prayer, more in-depth workshops, minyan specifically intended for those who want to experience more meaningful davening, retreats, and more. Towards the end of today's workshop, after we have learned together and hopefully experienced a more meaningful mincha together, we want to debrief you and find out what you think. For those who cannot stay until the very end of today's program for that group discussion, please complete the evaluation form on your table and leave it uh, by the door when you, you leave today, if you have to leave early. I hope the rest of you will stay and participate in our discussion at 4.30 so we can share ideas and discuss next steps. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Rabbi Menachem Goldberger. Rabbi Goldberger grew up on the east side of Denver, where his father was the spiritual leader of Beit HaMedrash HaGadol Bet Yosef. 
Later, Rabbi Goldberger became a close disciple of the late Rabbi Shalom Tursky, the Hornish Steeple Rebbe, that was pronounced? Hornish Steeple Rebbe, who founded the Talmudic Research Institute. Rabbi Goldberger was invited to move from Denver to Baltimore in 1987 to become Rebbe of Congregation to Paris Yisrael, which had been founded the year before by 12 families. He and his wife, Bracha, moved to Baltimore, where they helped turn the small congregation into the thriving, well-known community it is today. His congregation is known for its emphasis on beautiful tunes and singing, and is often led by Rabbi Goldberger, who has composed many of his own nigunim, some of which are now sung around the world and are available on a CD called the Chavadid. <laughs> Rabbi Goldberger epitomizes the service of Hashem with Simcha, and we are fortunate to have him here with us today to speak about practical steps to more meaningful prayer. Please rise to welcome Rabbi Goldberger. privilege and honor to meet several times over the past number of years. And each time, you know, it's better than the previous one because it's hard to imagine that would be the case, but it's true. But every time I see your rug, I can feel with a sense of joy and honor, and it just continues to grow. And I know that your hashpa'a, this kehillah, and this community is great, and may it continue to rise. And may Mechayel Ochayel, Lorach Yavim Tovim. Allah, I see when you're wrapped in your Mishpacha. So I'm coming down here uh, this morning from uh, Baltimore, and the turnoff from the Baltimore Beltway 695 to I-70 West, I can't tell you how many times I've done that in my life. And of course this morning I missed it, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking to myself, here I am, I'm going to deliver a talk on tequila to a group of people, and I didn't dive in not to miss the exit. You know, you can dive in for everything. And I'm coming down 29 South, and I'm saying, I have to dive in for a lot of green lights right now. <laughs> <laughs> and for Hashem, most of them were green. Hashem answers our prayers. But then I realized I had something else that was going in my favor, that I'm speaking after lunch. And Jews are not so quick to finish lunch. Uh, I, did that. I had a little time on my side. Uh, it's really, it's an honor to be here today because I feel very attached to the topic, but that's a too weak of a word to describe to feel a, that you come together about today, davening. It's essential to Jewish life, as we all know. The first part of it, of our talk this morning is going, really going to be learning. We're going to learn together from a great sefer by Rabbi Moshe Chaim Vatato, the Derech Hashem, and I was able to bring down uh, handouts. Uh, please look on it as we learn. And the Derech Hashem by the Paul is you know, one of the fundamental forums on Machshava and on Hashkafa. There are many parallels between the Paul's work and Sifrei Hasidus that you find, and the Orachayim HaKadosh. They're all drawing on very similar sources to bring a, a cross points to Kla Yisrael for this latter part of the history in the Iqbisad and the Shifa. Now, davening is something that each and every Jew must discover uh, in their own way. Everybody has a different way to daven. And yet, at the same time, the yesodos of tefillah are, across the board, fairly similar for most Jewish people. We're going to discuss those yesodos and then try and look at them in a more individual way as well. We are told by our Chachamim that when the day Yisrael crossed the Yamsuf, that there were 12 paths through the Yamsuf, not just one. Each shevet had their own path. Uh, the Divrei Chaim was the Tzanzer Rav, Rav Chaim the Tzanzer Chaim Zechotzadik Libracha. 
And he said every Shevet not only had their own path in going through the Amthuf, but each Shevet, each tribe, has its own path in Tefillah. And originally, each of the Yud Be Shvatim, each of the 12 tribes of Israel, had their own Nusach HaTfilah. And over the course of history, those were all lost, except for a few. Nusach Ashkenaz remains, one of the original ones. And there was a 13th Nusach, a 13th gate, where anybody could walk through that gate. That was called, and now it is called, Nusach Sfar, but more so the Arizal, in his lifetime, he compiled and edited that 13th gate, and he held that anybody could walk through that gate. So we have some of those sha'arim of tefillah, some of those gateways left for us in our, in our days. In, in Hulcha's tefillah, in the Shulchan Aruch, the Mechaber writes that a shul should have 12 windows, yud beis halonas. It's not a chiyuv, it's not obligatory, but it's a nice thing for a shul to have 12 windows. Why is that the case? And I think the idea is that we're saying that we are standing in the Beis HaKnesses, in the shul. We are the 12 tribes of Israel. And each one of us has our own window, our own portal, to reach out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu through. And the 12 windows in the Beis HaKnesses correspond, I believe, to the 12 different nuschaos of tefillah that are specific to each of the 12 tribes. So that minhag, or that anhogatova, to put 12 windows in a shul, I think is related to this idea. And why a window? We see it all the way back in the Sefer Daniel, that it writes in Sefer Daniel that he stood in front of a window when he davened. And he often find, find great tzadikim daven in front of a, of a window. The idea being that for us, a window has certain connotations. It's a bridge from one place to another place, from inside to outside. And for Jewish people, tefillah is a window. It's a bridge from our world in Olam Hazet to higher Olamos, to much higher spiritual worlds. We should never think, as Jews, that traversing in higher olamas is beyond us. It's not. And as a matter of fact, it's really part of our daily life. It's taken for granted that a Jewish person who lives down here in Olam Hazet has the ability to affect higher olamas in everything that we do. Everything that we do. And most specifically when it comes to diving. So that window or those windows that we see in Shul they're saying to us, tefillah is the bridge. And we're going to go through that bridge and connect to, there's Rath Hashem, higher places, loftier places, through the tefillahs that we say. If we take a look at the Ram Paul, we're going to start on page 143. I think that's the first page of the handout that I gave out, 143. And it says, Ha HaTefillah. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly because I want to make sure that we absorb the flow of the Ramchal spot. Please. Do you care for questions or should we wait until a certain section? I'm going to wait until we finish a certain section and then we'll get some questions. Okay. Letter Aleph. Hine, inyan hatfilahu. The nature of davening is. Ki hine. Min hasdorim shesidra hachachma ha'ayanahu. Concerning the arrangements that God made in this world, that in order for created beings, meaning us, people, to receive Hashem's Shefa, His blessing, that we have to awaken ourselves toward Hashem, and draw near to Him, Vivakshu Fana and seek out his presence or his countenance. Now you know that the Ramchal does not waste a word. Every word he writes, every phrase he writes is important. The Gonda Vilna said there's not one extra word in the Nasilis Yashar. So he says three things here. 
Number one, we have to awaken ourselves, this overroom, motivate ourselves. Secondly, we have to draw near to Hashem. Thirdly, the Avakshu Pana, to seek out Hashem's countenance. And in order for Him to bring His Bracha down to us, Hashem attached that to these three things. According to the degree that we awaken ourselves to Him, so too the Shafa, the Bracha, that comes down to us. The Inlo Yisaruru. And if we don't motivate ourselves, lo yimashay flahem, that bracha will not come down. Ve'hine ha'adam baruchu chafetz v'rotzeh. Hashem wants there to be shatir v'etovas beruah b'chol zamanehem. That creations have good, and we have an abundance of good. God wants us to have good things. Ve'hikin lahem avodah zu devaryom v'yoma. And therefore, he established this avoda for us as a daily thing. That through it, we can draw down a flow of blessing and success. According to what we need in this world. Okay, now that's one principle. The, the Rampal's derech is that he, he builds a structure of thought laying one principle on top of another. So that's the first section. Now we'll go on to the second one, but keep the first one in, in mind. There is further depth in the matter. God gave man, human beings, knowledge, intelligence. And our intelligence is meant to be used by us to conduct and preside over our daily lives. It seems like a simple concept, really, but the Ramchal is saying that Hashem wants people to oversee their lives. But we shouldn't just live a life of abandonment to whatever happens. But as he says, Lihiyos menaheg atzmo. He gave us intelligence so we can be involved in our own lives and conduct our lives with intelligence. Ubisvuna. The he'emis hamasa alav lehiyos mefakeyach al tzorach of kula. And God gave us the burden, but really the responsibility, to oversee everything that we do. This is founded on two principles. One is in relationship to the importance of the human being. That God gave us intelligence to conduct our lives properly, and that has to do with the stature of the human being. But unlike an animal which relies on instinct for everything that they do, we rely on intelligence, deya. Vahasheni, and the second one, lihiyos lo esek ba'olam v'li kasher b'inyana. Very fascinating thing, the Ramchal says. Hashem wants people to be involved in the world. To be involved in the physical world the likasher, and to be tied to it. And this is what maintains human existence in the state that we're supposed to be in, as we mentioned above. There the Ramchal was talking about the world of Chol that we live in. We live in a world of Chol. It's a weekday world. It's a mundane world. Most of our life is spent in the world of Chol, or in the Hasidic Shesforim terminology, Noga. That's the world we live in. Shabbos, once every seven days. Yom Tev, once a year. The vast majority of our days are Chol. God made it that way. He wants it that way. And we're going to see why in a moment. 
And this way is a way of chol and not a way of kodesh. This is necessary for human beings according to how God wants us to be. So top of page 144. This is in truth a yurida for mankind. It is a descent of the human being that we have to be involved in the physical world. We have a neshama which would love to just be in shamayim and not be so tied down to this physical world. But, but there's a reason why we are. This yurida is necessary. The gorem es lo aliyah acharechein and it causes us an aliyah the principle of Yerida, the Tzorah Aliyah, can levur b'chelik risha, as we explained earlier. And the Rampal says there that God wants people to transform darkness into light. That's what he wants us to do here. That he could have made us like Malach and bright beings, illuminating the world like Adam HaRisham when he was first made. But God wanted man to specifically be involved in the physical world so we could give light to the physical world. And no other creation can do that. So that's the Yerida. <coughs> it's hard for us to be in Olam Hazet. We struggle with it, but it's necessary because we are the only <coughs> creation that can lift this world into a higher place. That's uniquely human. Ba'ulam. Even though this Yerida is necessary for us, but it can't be too much of a Yerida, otherwise we'll end up entrenched in the physical world, and that's not desirable. According to the amount that we become entangled in matters of this world, we become more distant from Hashem's light and living more in a state of darkness. So here's the paradox. God wants us to be in this world to light it up. At the same time, if we are too much into this world, we're going to sink. So as all things are in Yiddishkeit, it comes down to balance, to shikol. We're very focused on balance as Jews. We're here, we're in this world, but in a very balanced way. We're here enough so we can have contact with this world and elevate it, but not too much so we don't sink into physical reality. So how do we do that? So God made a refua for this. He made and He created the ability for us to rectify this situation. That every single day a person steps forward and he stands before God. And he asks God for his or her needs. Based on the passage, and he casts his burden on God. So we say, it's yours. What they say in the Lashon, handing it over to God. It's yours. It's a Jewish idea. I'm here. I'm about to go into the world. So I don't sink in too much. I got to throw up. I have to toss out this lifeline to Hashem to make sure that I'm hanging on to God before I enter the physical world. That's what tefillah does. So yachtim v'yizkare v'yamo l'fanav v'mimenu yishal kutzarafav v'olav yashlich yehavav v'yihiyeh ze reshis kloli v'yikori l'chol hishtad lusa This should be the first and primary act of Hishtadlus. Wow! You know what the Rampal just said? That Tfila is the Iker Hishtadlus. 
So we think that tefillah is prior to our hishtadlus. That we dive in, in the morning, and then we go out in the world and make a living. That's our hishtadlus. And you have to dive in before your hishtadlus. The Ramchal says, no, we're not looking at it the right way. The main act of Hishtadlus is davening. And that's the first thing that we do. Yikori l'chol Hishtadlus. Ad sheka asher yimasheich acharkach bisha'ar darchei ha-Hishtadlus. So that afterwards, when we get involved in those other ways of Hishtadlus, like going to work, making a living, shehem darchei ha-Hishtadlus ha-Enoshi, the human effort to earn a living and to get by in the world. Lo So it won't happen to us that we'll get too stuck in physical reality. Why? Because we already threw out a lifeline to Hashem before we went out into the physical world. So it's like we're standing on a boat and each and every day we have to go off that boat into the ocean and gather our fish and gather our needs. But before we do that, we make sure we're tied to the boat. When you're tied to the boat, you can't slip away too far. You're always connected to the source. That's what our tefillah is. We're always tied. Kevan shekavar hiktim betola hakol bo yisparach Because we began our day attached to God, <laughs> now the Yerida will not be too significant. But rather, it will be supported by this Tikkun of Tefillah. Okay, so several things that Ramchal said. Number one, we have to, as people, go about our life with intelligence. God wants that from us. Number two, the physical world ties us down. On the one hand, we need that in order to elevate it. On the other hand, we can't get too stuck here. So Hashem says, okay, here's the plan. Before you dive into the physical world, dive in. Approach me. Talk to me. And by doing that, and by saying, Hashem, it's in your hands. Now, I, now we go out into the world. We've established a firm connection that we don't just float off into sea, the sea of this physical world, and get lost. That's the Hakdama of Tila that we say each and every day. You can notice the Ramchal's Lashon to be mashlich Yehavo Allah, to cast our burden onto Hashem. That's the idea that we know everything comes from God. And even though we, we have to put forth the effort to do so, we know it's with, without His help we don't get anywhere. That's the way a person has to go into this world. I'm going to stop at this point. That's the first section of learning that we do. And if there are a couple of questions, I'll break for a few questions. And otherwise, we'll go on. Please. Uh -huh. I actually want to go back to your introduction. Please. Please. You spoke about Tzipilas Ashkenaz being from some original gate, and I wasn't yes. clear. Were you saying that there were 12 gates all the way back to the Shabbatim? Yes. yes. And Tzipilas Ashkenaz was one of them, like we have today? Correct. We call it Ashkenaz. I don't think it had that name back then, but we but call it Ashkenaz. We have a Siddur with Tehillim in it. Right. Those Tehillim were said by the Shabbatim? Uh, so, what they davened, you know, specifically what they davened, we're not exactly sure, but the idea that Tehillim could be said before David HaMelech wrote them is, is Chazal. We see our Ovos and our Imahos and Moshe Rabbeinu saying verses from Tehillim before they were written. So what happened? Those are Ruach HaKodesh Psukim. They're part of reality. David HaMelech, he was masking them, he comprehended them, he put them into writing in an official way. But they were part of the created world before David HaMelech wrote them down. And our earlier people comprehended them and actually even used them in their tefillah. So was tefillah's Ashkenaz one of the Shabbatim's yes. prayers? Yeah. But we don't know which one. Right. Not to my knowledge. I would imagine it was Yehuda or Ephraim, I would imagine, because those were the two that were not sent off. We have ten Shvatim that were sent into exile. So Yehuda, Ephraim, Binyamin, the ones where there's um, Sancheirib did not send off all twelve, only ten. 
Even though, I have before I say that we do have remnants of all the 12 Shvatim, even in our time. So it would seem logical that it would come from one of those two Shvatim. I look yeah. forward to be able to discuss more about this in the future. Amen. Thank you. So another comment or question? Please, yeah. Yes, I, I think that's a very radical idea that you just espoused. What you're saying is <coughs> that <coughs> the Torah Shabbat path came before the Torah Shabbat Sa'ad. Not really. I'll tell you why. So we, we know this idea, it's a Chazal, it's based on a Zohar and also a Midrash that he's takil ba'oraisa ubra alma. Hashem looked at the Torah and he created the world. So the Torah is the format through which the world was created. That means both the Torah Shebisa and the Torah Shebaopet, both of them. So when our Avos understood reality the way they did as Nevi'im, as prophets. They saw Torah in reality, both the written Torah and the oral Torah. They saw both. And our Chachamim tell us in the Gemara that Avraham Avinu kept the entire Torah before it was given. Not only that, he even kept the Durabon on Halachos. Like, how, how did he do that? Because those things are really part of the world that God made. And the world is structured based on them. Our Ovos understood them even before they were given both the Bifav and the Baalpet parts. They were masking both of them. So they could say Psukim before the Psukim were actually delivered into this world. And they could actually say over concepts of Chazal before those concepts were said because they're here. And they're here from the beginning of creation. So if they knew that, then what we're saying is that the Torah Shabbat as well as the Torah Shabbat were given multiple times. It was given once at Har Sinai, but the world was created based on them, and people who had the ability to see past the facade of the world, the external facade of the physical world, they penetrated true reality and they saw the Torah inside of the world. That's Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. That's our Avos and our Imos. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to have Matan Torah because <coughs> there are very few people who can penetrate the veneer of the physical reality and grasp Torah. There are very few Avraham Avinus in the world. So some, some people, some very great people did that. But in general, we have to have that from Hashem, and He gives us the Torah and says, here it is. This is what lies underneath the physical reality. 99.999% of all people need a Matan Torah in Har Sina. A few of us, our great people, were able to be masigit without that. Yes, is that some, a question in the back? Yes, were Please. you encouraged to the in the early afternoons of the it's, it's a great question that you're asking. It's a halakhic question, too. Is it preferable to Dada Mincha and Gadola earlier in the day? There's different, different opinions about that. I can't uh, tell you Psaq Halacha because Elu Ve'elu Divri Elohim Chayim. Both points of view in this are acceptable. Some people dafke dada mincha gedolei, they dada mincha earlier in the day. Part of it is the idea that you mentioned. Another part is because once the time comes to daven, why put it off? The reason why came in the mitzvah, so you want to daven right away. Others for, say no, it's better to daven later. It's a more propitious time to daven later in the day. For practical reasons, for minion reasons, like all rabbis know, it's good to daven mincha mar together very hard to get people to come back to shul again, so just let it happen once in the evening for practical reasons. So each one is okay. You got to find your, your right path in that. Let me take one or two more, please. Yeah. Back to your introductory yeah. comments of the Chavonot. Yes. It was beautiful what you said about the 12 Thank windows. You. I've also heard the idea that we should dive in with windows and, and shul should be built with windows uh, to let the outside world in as well as us going out. Mm -hmm. My problem with that is that I lose my concentration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you say something about 
Yeah, sure. Yeah, um, I, I don't see it that way. I, I don't see really the idea of the window as letting the outside world in. I see it more going the other direction, that those windows are between earth and Shemayim, and we're meant to be going upward there. There is a concept, uh, like the Ramchal said here, of taking that which is in the world and being influenced by it, because we live here, and then taking everything we have and lifting it up to our Kodesh Baruch Hu. And from that perspective, I could reconcile that, what you were saying, but one has to be careful not to be overwhelmed by the outside world. I always find that, on a practical level, that windows in the front of the shul, it's good if they're elevated. Because <laughs> then you just look right up to the sky, and that's fine, right? If you're looking out onto the street with the windows, that's very distracting. Sure, please. My question is this, it's not directly involved in what you say, but close enough, I think. Um, women who have children don't have the same obligations as men and mm -hmm. But women who are no longer um, uh, have young children in the house, um, are they obligated to say Shachrit Nincha Maruf every day because the uh, they don't have the children any longer, or the things that keep up their time? Okay, so in terms of really answering your question, you have to direct that over here to Rabbi Rosenbaum. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask you later. Right. And here. lucky for me, I'm off the hot seat right now, so we can talk later if you like. Okay, I didn't know. Uh, that's a halakha lemaisa question, so of course, Rabbi Rosenbaum can certainly answer your shayla. Okay. I'll address it in general, though, because the idea is really important and very relevant. Now, women, in terms of tefillah, children or not children, the obligations are really, they're exempt in, at a certain level. It's a mitzvah saseh shazman brahma, it's a time bound mitzvah. And a woman who's got little kids running around her house, and a woman whose children are, are out of the house and married and on their own, that line by the letter of the law is the same. It's the same thing. We understand that a woman is more involved in the house. And some would like to say that's the rationale behind exempting her from tefillah. She's got so, many, so much to do in her home. With children, even more so. Even without children, she's got plenty to do in her home. I'm sure there are higher reasons for this too. That's just one angle on it. But in that respect, there's no real difference. It's what, what a woman is in respect to tefillah and her nature and how God endowed her as a woman. Uh, on a practical level, sure, if a woman has more time to dive in, if she has more time, it's the right thing to do for her to dive in. Uh, some say that a woman really should dive in. Shachar Sandin, they have a Ramban that says women should dive in thoroughly, completely. But on a practical level, that's not so um, easy to accomplish. The Rambam says that davening min ha-Torah, the words of the Rambam, the person wants to fulfill the Torah obligation in davening, you basically say, I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase the Rambam, please, Hashem, God of the universe, help me today. Done. We just daven, right? So when women asked me, you know, they didn't daven, I said, did you ask God for help this morning when you got your kids out for carpool? They said, at least five times. You daven. You daven. Please, Hashem, help me get this child out of the front door into the carpool. Yosef, right? You just fulfilled your mitzvah to rights of davening. Truly. Yeah? So how many times have you davened in the morning? Probably 10, 15, 20 before you even started the day. And that's a real thing. So somewhere in there, between the Rambam and the Ramban, how much you should say, I think that's a very individual shayla for each woman. And that's important to talk over with your Rav. Where are you in life, and what can you say, and what's practical and what's spiritual, and trying to tie that all together. Okay. I'm going to take one more, and then we'll go a little by to Please. Uh -huh. um, back to your introduction. Yeah. Um, about the 13th gate, you said it could be approached by anyone. Yes. Um, I didn't really understand. So is that just referring to, um, it's like improvisational? No, it's not. It's, I hear what you're saying. The 13th gate, which became known as Nusach Ari, Nusach Sfar, in very general terms, that has a fixed Nusach as well. 
It's not, it's not improvisational. It's a real structure of tefillah, but it's open to all. And you get there this question, a great question that came up, uh, an enormous question in the, in the 18th and 19th centuries amongst great postgames. Can, are you allowed to switch from Nusach Ashkenaz to Sfar? Because many people were doing that who were followers of the Baal Shem Tov. Are you allowed to switch from Sfar to Ashkenaz? <coughs> Very great people answered these questions. The great machlokas between the Hassan Sofer and the Divrei Chaim. The Divrei Chaim said you were allowed to switch from Ashkenaz to Sfar. The Hassan Sofer said you're not allowed. So if you're a Hassan, you do. If you're not a Hassan, you don't. That's what it comes down to, really. But these are halachically very, very um, significant questions. But as far as the Nusuf itself, it has its own structure, its own feeling. Is one superior to the other? Not in my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I have seen people say this one is better, this one is higher. I, I, don't, I don't accept it. Every Nusuf is Kadosh and it's holy. The Chafetz Chaim Davin Nusuf Ashkenaz. I'm sure his fila was very high up there. The Sfas Semes and the Imre Emes Davin Nusuf Sfar, I'm sure their tefillas were very high up there. And the, the great rabbis of Chabad, they Davin Nusuf Hari. So one's higher, one's lower, not in my opinion. They're all great. They all get a person where they need to go, this connectedness to our Kaddish world. Yeah. Okay, so a couple of thoughts, and now we'll take a break from the Ramchal for a minute. So where can we go, you know, to look to spirituality in Fila because it's such a spiritual experience? We're going to go right to the Shulchan Aruch. Right to the Shulchan Aruch because the Shulchan Aruch, which talks about the laws of Tefillah, if you open up the words a little bit, you'll see simultaneously words that are spiritual, words that are physical, and words that are practical. It all comes together. So a couple of halachas. These halachas, if you want to look at them, they're in, in, the, in the Mishnah Baruch, which is the first chalak of the Shulchan Aruch or Rechaim. So Simen Sadiq, Sadiq Aleph, Sadiq Beis. For about 10, 12, maybe a little more, Samanim, it's all Hilchos Tefillah. And a lot of that is very educational in addition to some of it being obligational. So a couple of things. I'm going to first take this from Simon Tzadik, that the Mechaber says in Seif Yud Beis, that it's a mitzvah la let me Let me read the Lashon of the Mechaber, the author of the Shulchan Aruch. Uh, Simon Tzadik, Seif Yud Beis. Mitzvah la roots kishahole for Beis Agneses. It's a mitzvah to run to Shul. Wow. I don't see too many people running to shul. <laughs> Driving too fast to shul, yes, that I do. <laughs> then we have to say, slow down, slow down. The chen l'chol devar mitzvah. And so too for any devar mitzvah, for any mitzvah that we're doing, it's a mitzvah to run, to do the mitzvah. Asilu b'shavis. Even on Shabbos, sh'osr so siyo gasa, where you're not allowed to take big steps because Shabbos is a relaxed, tranquil day. <laughs> but when you leave the shul, you're not allowed to run. Now when I hear this, I hear a halacha, but I also hear very profound spiritual guidance in these words. It's a mitzvah to run, to go to do a mitzvah. So that's that means that when we go out in the world, like the Ram Paul was telling us, and we know the world kind of ties, ties us down, there are certain things in the world that don't tie us down. And in actuality, they lift us up. What are those things? Mitzvot. So mitzvot are roots. It's a mitzvot to run. Number one, it's Ratzon Hashem. That's what God wants us to do. So of course we run. We don't want to knock somebody down along the way. And that we learn from the great Baal Muster, Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, who said, when you put your talis on and you swing it over, make sure not to hit somebody else with your strings on your talis, right? My father, Zifan Ali uh, once told one of my nephews who was, who was running to Shul, 
And he said, be careful not to knock somebody else down on your way to Shul. And he wasn't just talking only literally. So Mitzvah Larut, we're going to do Ratzon Hashem. There's an opportunity to do something in the world that will lift us up, that will lift the world up. Run! This is why we're here. Go do it. Carefully? Yeah, of course. When it comes to leaving the shul, running, chas v'shalom, then it seems like we're trying to get out of there. And we don't want to, even if we're kind of feeling that things going a little late one day, uh, so just keep that in your heart. Don't let it manifest in your feet. Don't run out of the shul. Take your time when you go out to the shul because it's, it's sad that we have to leave shul. Davening is over. And we don't want to give the message that we're anxious to leave. Now, there's another halacha about Yikonais Beis Pesachim. This is in Sif Chaf, the same simon in the Mechaber. And he says, Yikonais Shiyur Shnei Pesachim Bahar Kachis Pala. When you go into a shul, enter the shul the amount of two Pesachim, two doorways. So let's say a doorway is approximately two or three feet, approximately. So two Pesachim, make sure that you're in there four to six feet into the shul. So halakhically, why? Because if I come in shul and I walk in the door and I'm standing right here, I'm giving the impression that I don't really want to be here. I just got to be right next to the door, and if something comes up, I can just quickly get out. Whereas if you go into the shul, then you're in. But why shnei p'sachim? Why two doorways? Shnei p'sachim. Whenever you see the word Pesach in Torah literature, it means an opening, and it means an opening. There's a physical one, and there's a spiritual one. I think the two psachim on a ruchniyastika level that perhaps are hinted to here is the heart and the mind, the moach and the leif. The two things a person must open up in davani. We have to open up our mind to be aware that we're, we're reading and speaking about concepts that are profound and that are great and the Anshe Knesses Hagadola looked at every single word and every single letter to make sure we would say it. So we have to put it in our mind. And secondly is our heart. The heart must open up somewhere in Davani. So Shnei Pesachim, make sure that you're in two doorways, two windows, our mind and our heart. If we go into Shul and we're not really all the way in, we're kind of in, and kind of out, like Eliyahu Hanavi said, we have our feet on two branches, one foot in, one foot out. So how are we going to daven like that? How are we, are we really going to daven if we're not all the way in? So go in. And then secondly, go in, this way. Get in the shul, get in the moach, get in the leif. It's not hard to see ramazim, hints, the spiritual concepts in halachos, which are practical halachic ideas. Okay, another one. We are familiar with this, with this from a Mishnah in Brachos. The Mechaber says in Simon Sadi Gimel, Sif Aleph. I'll read his lashon again. Sadi Gimel, Sif Aleph. Yashe Sho'o Achas Kodim Shiyakum Lihis a person should pause, contemplate. For sho'o achas, literally means an hour, before he davens, k'deshi yechaven liba l'makam. So he or she can direct their heart to Hashem. The sho'o achas, achar hatfila, And another hour after davening. Shalot tehe niras alav kemasui. So that davening should not appear like a burden to us. Shemamahir let's say sminana, and that we're trying to get away from it quickly. The Mishnah says that Hasidim Harishoni, earlier righteous people, they were shoheth one full hour before they daven. They contemplated and meditated on Kedushas Hashem and Kedushas Hatfila. 
every time they daven. Then they daven. And then after davening, they contemplated and meditated for another hour every time they daven. That's nine hours a day. Chakras mincha mairam, every single day. Now when we think about that, we say, impossible. I want to tell you the truth. For people, I'm just going to speak for myself, for someone like myself, impossible. I could never do that. But what could we do? Maybe we could take 10 seconds. We could take 10 seconds before we dive in and just clear our mind for a minute. So instead of jumping from the car into the shul, Ashra Yosheva which we all do, just walk into the shul and wait and think about where we are, this Makam Kadosh, 10 seconds, that's all it takes, even five, then Ashra Yosheva It's a small but highly important Eitzah in Thila. And if we're davening at home, Zelvazah, the same thing. Instead of, okay, I need to dive in at home today, going over into my dining room, going right into tefillah, so step over to the shtender or wherever your makom is, and wait five, ten seconds, think about what we're about to do. Shohe, contemplate. I'm standing before Hashem. Right now I'm leaving the world behind. Asher Yashver So it doesn't have to be an hour. And for us, if we took an hour before davening to contemplate, you know where we would end up? The stock market, the World <laughs> Series, the Freakness, and everything. We, we're gone. In 15 seconds, we're gone. We take too much time, and we're going to end up who knows where. Five, ten seconds. We don't have big attention spans nowadays. But a short amount of time really works. Then davening is over. So instead of davening is over, got my tefillin zekel, got my talis zekel, I'm out the door. So instead of that, davening is over. Wait, five seconds. Let the tefillah kind of seep into our bones for a few seconds. Then go out the shul. I think it's such a great asa. It works. It really works and it doesn't take a lot. It's very, very practical. The Kedusha Slavi, Rav Levi Yitzhak Abreditch of Zechotzadik Libracha, who was a fire, he was a walking fire of a person. And his tefillah, for those who were Zochet to hear him daven, uh, people were just, in our lesson, blown away by his tefillah. So, one time after Minyan, after Shmon Esrei rather, he approaches a man who just finished Shmon Esrei, and he says, Shalom Aleichem. So the man says, Rebbe, Aleichem Shalom, but why are you saying Shalom Aleichem to me? I've been here the whole time. So the Vedic said to him, you've been here the whole time? He says, as soon as you stepped into the evening, you went down to the marketplace, you did a couple of deals, you said hi to a few friends, you made a little money on the way back, and then, Ose Shalom Bim Rama, you came back to Shul. So I say, Shalom Aleichem. <laughs> nice to see you again. <laughs> Bredit Shavarav. And remember that the Bredit Shavarav was Malame Tzuchus on all Jews. So if you have a statement like that coming from him, we've got to pay attention to it. He always saw the positive. He always saw the positive in Jewish people. He once saw... He once saw a wagon driver scraping mud off of the wheels of his wagon and davening chakras at the same time. So he looks at that and he, he looks toward, to, toward Shemayim and he says, Ribona Shaloyla, a master of the universe, look how precious your children are. That even while he's scraping the mud off of his wheels, your name will never part from his lips. Uh, we call that reframing, right? <laughs> Vedic was great at reframing. He looked to Shemaim and said, look at your precious children, Ribbon Shalom. One more quick story, because once you're talking about Rebbe Levi Yitzhak of Vedic it's hard to stop. One more quick story. Uh, he saw a, a Jew who was eating on Tisha B'ad. 
And he came over, he said, Rabbi, uh, perhaps you don't know that today is Tisha B'Av. He said, no, Rabbi, I know today is Tisha B'Av. He said, Rabbi, maybe you don't know that a Jew is not allowed to eat on Tisha B'Av. He said, no, Rabbi, I know that a Jew is not allowed to eat on Tisha B'Av. Okay, Rabbi, maybe you're sick, so you have to eat. He said, no, Rabbi, I'm perfectly healthy. So the B'ditcher Rav turned to Shemayim and he says, once again, Rebona Shalom, master of the universe, look at your precious children. I gave him every opportunity to lie, and all he would do is speak the truth. <laughs> <laughs> That's how he saw people in the Lame Zafus. So he said to somebody, Shalom Aleichem, after Zav, you've got to pay attention to that. And it applies to all of us. We go somewhere else when we dive in. Where we are supposed to go in our tefillah is upward. Sometimes we go out, but we're meant to go up. There's a Pesach there, there's an opening there. And we take advantage of that opening to try and climb upward. Several years ago, Rav Steinman Shlita from Eretz Yisrael visited America and he came to Baltimore. And I went to hear him speak. And he quoted this Mishnah about the Hasidim Harishonim who used to meditate for an hour before davening and then daven and an hour afterwards. And he asked the following question. He said, why do we need to know this? He says, does Nishayef, it doesn't pertain to us. Why do we need to know this? And he answered and he said, because we do need to know that it's humanly possible and that there are Jews who could do this or who can do this. And if I can't, that's fine. But we need to know it is possible. So when I heard that, it opened up the door for me. Because I think I realized at that moment, when it comes to davening, I think that we are capable of much more than we give ourselves credit for. We have conditioned ourselves into davening at a certain pace, with certain thoughts, and we could, if we really put forth the effort, break away from our very fixed patterns of tefillah and accomplish things that we would normally think we're not able to do. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of concentration and a lot of perseverance, but it can be done, especially with small steps. 10 seconds before, 10 seconds after. Okay, a couple other halachas that I want to share with you. The Rambam says, this is from the Rambam and Hilchos Tefillah, Perak Aleph, sorry, Perak Hay. Shmona Devarim, there are eight things that are requirement in Shmona Esrei. Amida, standing up. Nocha Hamikdash, facing the base Hamikdash, for us that's eastward. Tikkun haguf, making sure that a person's body is prepared to daven. That basically means we have to make sure to go to the bathroom before we daven, so we don't have to feel that way in the middle of davening. Tikkun hamalbushim, the tikkun of our clothing, uh, to dress in a dignified way before we daven. Kolechad kafi darko, each person according to how they dress, but it should be dignified. Tikkun hamakom, the place where we daven. We don't want to daven in a place which is not suitable for tefillah. Hashvoyas hakol. Directing our, vo our voice properly. And you know what that means in davening? Not davening too loud and not davening too soft. And the Rambam includes that as one of the eight crucial ingredients for tefillah. I find that very interesting. And the last two. Hakriya, bowing down, as we do as part of our davening, and of course, Hishtachavoya in the Beis HaMikdash when they went all the way down, like we, we do on Yom Kippur. It's on the Kaf HaChaim, that a person who is Yoreid Lifnei Teva, a person who davens for the Amid, that the word Teva, Tuf, Yud, Beis, He, is a Rashi Tevos. Again, this comes from the Kaf HaChaim. And it's Tefila Yeshara Bekavana Sale. Teva. Tefila Yeshara Bekavana Sale. An upright davening with the intention 
of that. <coughs> Something for us to keep in mind. I talked earlier about windows. And I have a few window stories. And they're all connected to Davening, Kalonas. My Rebbe, as Stuart mentioned at the beginning, was Rabbi Shlomo Tursky, as I saw. I grew up in Denver, Colorado. My father was a rabbi there. And Rabbi Tursky was a rev in our community. And he was a rabbi, or a disciple rabbi. Uh, I knew him my whole life. My father and he were very friendly. They're both in Rabbanus together in the same city. Our families were close. When I was 18 years old, I took it upon myself to go to him and to learn, which I did for the next five years or so. He came from a great line of tzaddikim, Chernobyl. His grandfather was Rablebola Tursky who was one of those who lived through World War I, made his way ultimately to America. On his way to America, Rablebla lived in Antwerp for a while, and he had a base midrash there. And he used to daven in front of a window. One time after davening, his Hasidim said to him, Rabbi, didn't you teach us that we're not supposed to daven Shmon Esri with our eyes open? He said, yes, that's what the Chachamim say. So they said, Rebbe, why were you davening Shmuel yesterday with your eyes open? <coughs> so he said, I what? <coughs> they said, yes, you were. He said, the day that I can tell the difference between my eyes open and my eyes closed in Shmuel Esrei, I'll stop davening. So apparently he had reached a place in Tefillah where his eyes were open but open to something else, not open to what was right in front of him. That's one window story. Another window story, this one by the Avdur Rav, Lechut Tzadik Libracha. It's Kiddush Levana. The Avdur Rav, the Kiddush Levana, had a look of distress on his face. He went over to the window and he looked very concerned. The Hasidim said, Rebbe, what's the matter? He didn't answer. He went over to the window again and looked out the window and he looked relaxed and calm. His chassidim said, Rabbi, can you tell us what happened? He said, I'll tell you. When we did Kiddush Lavana, and it's only the month of Kislev, a few months into the year, I saw that all of the Parnassah for our, for our city that was ordained from Shemaim, it's all used up. So I'm very concerned only three months into the year. So they said, Rebbe, what happened after that? He said, then I saw that it also happened on a previous year, a different time. And when that time came, that the Parnassa from our city was used up, Hashem reached into his own pockets and provided us for the rest of the year. That's the second window story. That's very important to tefillah, because there's tefillah, what we ask for, and what we deserve, and what is decreed. And that's one part of tefillah. There's another part of tefillah which is above and beyond any decree, and any gezera. And it's, so to speak, reaching into Hashem's pockets for His infinite compassion and mercy, and His rachamim. And that overrides everything. And when a Jew davens with a pure heart, Rahman Ali Baboy, they can reach into HaKadosh Baruch Hu's pocket, Kiviyachal, and bring down things that are beyond any decree. They're connected to Hashem's Rahani. The third window story is about the tefillah of the Yachid, an individual's tefillah. Tefillah of Yachid is like this. Reb Chaim Shmuel Levitz, the Chutzadik Libracha was the Rosh HaYeshiva of the Mir Yeshiva in Yerushalayim. He escaped Europe and he made his way to Eretz Yisrael. I had a Rebbe once who was his Talmud. And he told me that once in the Mir Yeshiva he passed by the Beis Midrash and Rav Chaim Shmulevitz was sitting there by himself. And he was learning over a page of Gomorrah. 
and he's learning, and he has a very perplexed look on his face. He walks up and he goes over to the window and he says, Tata, if I stay nicht. He says, My father, I don't understand. And he goes back to the Gomorrah and he learns. And once again, he has this very perplexed look on his face and he's pacing and he walks over to the window and he says, Nochamo, Tata, ich kenne ich verstehe. My dear father, Hashem, I don't understand. He goes back to the Gomorrah one more time. He sits down and he sees a big smile come over the face of Rav Chaim Shmulevitz. He walks over to the window and he says, Tata Adank. Father, thank you. <coughs> Tfila. That's not Tfila Mitzibur, that's not Chakras, that's not Mincha, that's not Mar, that's not Ne'ila. That's a personal Tfila from a sincere Jew to Hashem. Please help me understand this page of Gemara. And when he understood, thank you. Now, if we could implement that in our lives, that tefillah is part of our lives, and we talk to Hashem, and we ask things from Hashem, then davening in shul is, is an extension of that. We don't have to break away from our life to daven in shul. It's an extension of our relationship with God. <coughs> and now it manifests b'tzibor in shul with other people where we try and connect our hearts together. But it starts very much, if I could pin down davening to one thing, it is a Jew's relationship to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, verbalizing it, talking about it, and enhancing that relationship. Tefillah is so broad in our lives, and there's a room for it in so many places in our lives, I feel if we can walk into any one of those doors in davening, Tefillah B'tzibur door, the Tefillah B'yachi door, the door of our heart, the door of our soul. We can walk in one of those doors in Tefillah, because there are many that are open, then we're in. And then once we're in, the momentum starts to grow and it starts to build. It's a battle, it's a struggle. Sha'as Krava, Sha'as Tzlosa, the Zohar says, the time for davening is the time for battle. It is a battle. But if we start to develop that momentum, then we are armed for the battle. Okay, now I don't have a watch or a clock, a clock in front of me, so you can tell me what time it is. I'll know if I'm done. <coughs> Ten, okay, so let me take a question or two, and then we'll take a look a little bit at the second round call. Please. I thought it was really interesting that a lot of this mentioned about the snake sucking. Yes. Doorways, yes. Yes. It seems to be making a statement not so much about the person himself or herself, but about the community too. When other people are seeing other people out in the community who don't feel so motivated, they are all, all the way out already from what they're in. Mm -hmm. and it, it really has an influence and an effect on the entire social atmosphere. Excellent. Uh, it's, it's doing more, more than one thing at once when you're trying to come in a little bit closer. Excellent. It's a, it's a beautiful point that you're making. And a very relevant point, because when we dive in Betzibur, we really have to be aware of other people. <coughs> the Gemara says that when Rabbi Akiva daven by himself, he started in one side of the room and he ended up on the other side of the room, when he was by himself. When he daven in Betzibur, he stayed still. Now, some people don't get that. That they think that in Betzibur, you just do whatever you want. But that's not feel of the sea world. Is that confining? It is confining to a, a certain extent, but it's for a higher reason. And sometimes we as Jews, we put parameters on ourselves for the sake of a higher principle. I have no right to disturb somebody else's doubting because I want to jump around. If everybody in Shul is jumping around, that's a different story. Right? You go to Carlene and they dive, they're all <coughs> screaming. Everybody screams. The first time I dive in Carlene in Yerushalayim, I walked in, I'm standing there, all of a sudden, <coughs> I, 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 I almost <laughs> fell over. 
there were 400 people screaming at the top of their lung at the same time. Like that. And, but they all scream. Okay, that's fine. But if nobody's screaming and you are, that's not fine. <laughs> Was that a hand up? Was that a hand up? On this side of the stand? No? Yeah, please. No. Yes, uh, way back when you began on the windows, Rabbi, yeah. you, you made the reference to the Leal. Yeah. And where it specifically says his windows were open until you were shut yeah. Now, is that just a mechanical thing of Beis or is there some consciousness about you to show life that should be in the prayers of all the time? Absolutely. Consciousness and awareness of Yerushalayim. Hill Talpiyas are coming to say that it is the hill or the mountain, Shekol Piyas, that all of the mounts of the Jewish people turn toward. So if we could visualize this, if we could see, if we had eyes to see, when people were davening across the globe, we would see our tefillos going to Yerushalayim from every part of the world. To Yerushalayim, and from there, us. So we are meant to go toward daven, toward Yerushalayim, and know that's the holiest place in the world. That's, once again, the window where all of our tefillos rise up. No matter where we are in the world, we're meant to be davening toward Yerushalayim, the Beis HaMikdash. So our, our tefillos and our consciousness really goes there and goes up. So be aware of that. Please. I'll mention something that I'm struggling with. So if it's relevant or something you do later, fine. But I don't, and many people don't like to come on to others and to ask, give me. We generally don't like to do that. But in our tefillah and in our Shmona Estray, a good part of that is asking Hashem, give me. And I don't quite know how to view that vis a be that on the same way. That's a great question. And it is uncomfortable to ask, as we all know. But we, we have to absorb the reality that all things come from Hashem. All things. So the idea of asking from Hashem is exactly what He wants from us, because it shows that we know where it comes from. Now, if I feel uncomfortable about asking another person, there's Busha in there, I feel ashamed, you know, sometimes we have to ask. But asking something from Hashem, who's the source of all bracha, that's right on the mark. Because then we're really asking from where it truly comes from. And God wants us to ask from Him. So to speak, He gets nachas from us when we ask from Him. It's like a child asking their parent for a little food. You know how nachas that is as a parent when you give your child something good. You feel, it makes you feel good. So that metaphor between us and Hashem is very similar. Okay, yes, please. I have two questions that are sort of related. Javani is done very quickly. Yeah. Even if you understand the language and you understand it, or it can get to be very much by rote. Yeah. And you're racing through it. So how would you say to make the question of that? One of the great dilemmas of, of davening with Seaboard, the, the two points that you, that you raised. Now, a shul is a place for community. We always struggle to find, as shuls, you know, what is the appropriate length for a tefillah. Uh, as, at Seaboard, I think that we as people are a little too hung up on it. It's five minutes late. Oy vey. Yeah. What's the big deal? Five minutes late. It really isn't a big deal. But a lot of people in the, in the shul feel that it is a big deal. Now, if someone has to go to work, it is a big deal. If someone has to drive carpool, it is a big deal. So they need to finish because they got to get to do what they're doing. On Shabbos morning, is it a big deal? I, I don't think so. But a lot of people in my shul think so. Right? <laughs> <laughs> So, how do you balance that? 
Also, you know, I see this a lot. Someone's complaining about shuls running five minutes late and they're in a hurry. Then I go out in the hall, 10 minutes later, they've been schmoozing with somebody for the last 15 minutes. <laughs> I thought you had to go. <laughs> schmoozing is different, okay. Well, those are the things that we do. We're, we're an interesting people. So, in, in my mind, there's no real answer to this question. I hate to disappoint, there's no real answer to it. But more so, an approach. So let's say I know that I need a little more time in davening. I could come to davening early. And I could start davening early. And then be with the tzibur, and that works. I know people who do that. That the davening goes too fast for them, so they come ten minutes early, they start ahead, and by the time they're in the Shmon Esrei area, Shma, Shma, Shmon Esrei area, they're together with the Sibur. So that's how they deal with it. Because the Shul can't finish later. Things are happening in people's lives. Other people will stay a little longer. <coughs> like they'll get the Shema to Esther with the Tzibur, which is the most important thing, and then they'll stay a little longer. Now, you have a little more leeway in this as a woman. Because a woman can daven less, and it's okay. A man has a stricter standard. So therefore, if you came to shul as a woman, and you, you said to yourself, I want to touch on the basic structure of tefillah, and then say Shemona Esrei B'tzibur, that's, that's fine and dandy for a woman to do that. And then you can take your time with those tefillos that you choose to say, and get up to Shemona Esrei with B'tzibur. By the letter of the law, a man can do that. There are certain things he can skip in order to daven with B'tzibur, but it's not recommended. We're meant to daven the whole thing if we can. But a woman has more, more flexibility with that. So I think that what a person can do is consider in their mind, can I figure out a way where I can be with the tzibur and at the same time satisfy my need to daven a little slower or a little more in depth. And I mentioned some of the ways where that's possible. The other thing, which is a bigger effort, a community effort, than a Kla Yisrael effort, is I, I do believe that we need, as a people, to expand our davening time and be open to davening a little longer. We're too hung up on finishing davening chick chak And usually for no good reason, except that we want to move on. Now, you, you're a whole room of people gathered together, you know, and part of your shul, together with your rug. So, is that going to become part of what you think about, what you decide? Maybe there's a mentality that's created <coughs> about taking a little more time. As, as a shul, would I recommend that to you? Never. It's not my place. It's not my place to do that, because it's your shul, and it has its own culture and its own way of working. Would it work? Would it not work? I don't know. But maybe part of coming together is figuring out a way to time-wise get a little more out of davening. Because I don't have any easy answers. Uh, a lot of this is Tzibur related. And it takes a Tzibur to try and figure this out. A lot of shuls nowadays have an early minion, late minion, hashgama minion, so each one is trying to do its own thing. But trying to accomplish this, that each one kind of gets their time, but isn't it taking away a little bit from the octus of the tzibur to have five different minyanim, or six, or seven, or eight? And what about the concept of davening the tzibur? I was talking to a friend of mine in Baltimore who's a rub, and he says, pretty soon we're going to have a minion for age 30, 31, <laughs> minion for age 32, 33, minion for age 39, 40, like in the dover so because everybody needs it to be an exact certain way. So something's wrong there. I'm just identifying and empathizing with you. Something's wrong that when it comes to davening the tzibur, it requires give and take. It's understood there has to be a little bit of sacrifice in davening the tzibur, and it's an important and necessary thing. Where that will come out for any tzibur and for you, for this tzibur, I don't know. 
but I think it's an important thing to, to consider. Please. For those of us who are involved in the chinuch, um, do you have any suggestions for how we can encourage the young people to feel more engaged in their conversation with the it's a great question. One thing I think is to normalize talking to God. Like that story from Rakhine Shmulevitz. Like a story like that goes a long way. That people can talk to God. And that it's not strange or unusual, it's Jewish. And if a teacher can normalize with their students that this is what we do, that we speak to our Kaddish Baruch because we are his children then at a very young age, they can feel comfortable with that. And if, if we can get that message across to our kids, I think we've opened up a lot of doors for them in our field. Please. Yeah, throughout my life, I mean, just thinking about people I've been around who, who I think really have the blood, is my impression. Yeah. Some of them are, are not Jewish, some of them are not from Jews. Mm -hmm. I assume the 13th window, their prayers go through the 13th window. Everybody. Well, I'll tell you this. Um, the 13th gate, and I said, it, it does have a structure. So I, I don't believe that those tefillos are going through the 13th gate. That's one of the nuschaos. That's one of the actual nuschaos of tefillah. But are those prayers going up to Shemaim in their own gate, and their own pathway? In my mind, absolutely. Absolutely. Jew, non-Jew, everybody is entitled to pray to Hashem. And God listens to all people. So they don't have to go through. Those are, those are Nusaf gates that have to do with Minhag and Nisora. But in terms of personal prayer, you know, every, every person has their own personal prayer. Gate to our Kaddish Baruch Hu. Please. The return of the base of Mikdash is central. Uh, that would entail uh, Karbonos, which is a concept that the contemporary mind struggles with mightily. Yeah. I'm looking for a, a nuanced uh, discussion of this whole topic that makes it accessible to you know 21st century Jews. That is not just apologetics. I'm constantly looking for this. I haven't heard it yet. Uh, what do we do? When it comes to that time, the dry Hashem Bakar of the Amenu, right? So I'll tell you my thought on it. We see, we see things in a certain way. We live in the 21st century. The Beis HaMikdash was 2,000 years ago and more. When we see an animal, we see something. When they saw an animal, they saw something else. When Mashiach comes, the Nabi says in Yeshaya that the whole world will be filled with knowledge of Hashem. Our vision is going to change because everybody will be a Nabi, everybody will have Ruach HaKodesh at that time of Mashiach. The personal gift from Hashem that each person has. I personally believe that when that happens, we will understand very well what Karbanos mean, because we will see the world in a different way. And that animal soul, that nefesh havahamis, which is in the animal that's being offered to Hashem, we will understand it and grasp it, and how it's related to our own nefesh and neshama in some way. For us now, that's intellectual. We're offering up his life, it's attached to my life, so it's an intellectual thing, we don't quite get it. But I do believe that we will get it, like we will get many other things once Umala Ha'aretz Deus Hashem and our perception of reality has changed. So our problem is that we're trying to understand Mashiach time in a pre-Mashiach state of being, which we can't really do. So we have a limitation on that. I do believe we'll get it when the time comes. That's my approach to it. Is that specific? It's not satisfying in that sense, oh, now I get it, but I do believe we will get it. And it has to be that way, that our view of reality will change. Please, nice to see you. Uh, up to this time, uh, <coughs> focus Sorry. and locus of the presentation has been 
us. I, think. Uh, I have, over the past many, many years, been on the, under the influence of Professor Yeshayahu Leibovich, Allah uh, Shalom. And with him, the idea is more the mitzvah that for us, we have a Brit with Hashem, and it is fulfilled by a Torah mitzvah. And the mitzvah that we have is tied to the Bet HaMikdash and the Avodah of presenting the Behemah, let's say, Korban to Hashem, and giving a perfect, <coughs> a perfect Korban to Hashem without necessarily thinking of what I'm going to get out of it, but that this is uh, a chofa or a chiyuf that I have to give that on a regular basis, giving God what he has asked of me to give. And not, not necessarily thinking, boy, I, you know, I'm really feeling something fantastic. I've asked Hashem for a gift of some sort, and I want this, and I need this, and this is what I'm getting out of tefillah. Just want to take a look. I think it's a very important aspect of tefillah. So there, there is something that is present in our society, which I call spiritual self-centeredness. And religion and Yiddishkeit can become a self-centered thing. It's my spiritual growth. It's my relationship with Hashem. So there is some self-centeredness about spiritual matters. And the truth is that at, a, at an optimum level, there's a concept of l'shem shamayim, which is an elusive and difficult thing to attain. <coughs> But ultimately, we are trying to connect to God. Laman Shemav. Laman Cho Hashem, Hoshienu. And there's a very important part of tefillah which hopefully we can reach that we're davening. Laman Shemav. It's nothing to do with what we gain out of it, what we get from it. It's all Lakayim Ratzon Hashem in tefillah. Now that, it is true that that concept runs through all mitzvahs of lishma, and it is true it's probably the most difficult thing for a person to attain. And if we think we did attain it, that means we did it. Because <laughs> then we stopped. And that part of it, of reaching out to Hashem to connect to Him because that's what He wants, that has to be another thread, another part of the fabric of our fila. I can just agree with it and say, yeah, we should be striving for that as well. This is what I want to ask you. So the second part of the Ramchal we didn't get to, but I want to ask you to learn that with your Hashav Rabbi Rosenbaum, because it's beautiful and it's great, and it, take, it takes a person on an experience through different halakhi fila and what they apply to what we're doing here and how they apply up there in higher worlds. So, I don't want to impose on Rabbi Rosenbaum's already very busy life, but if at some time you have the chance to learn that, great. If you want me to come back another time and learn it with you, I would. <laughs> to work it out with Stuart and I would. But I'm not inviting myself. I'm just, I'm just offering. And I, really I think want they're to inviting you. <laughs> That's what I uh, <laughs> I want to thank you for your beautiful participation. It's great to be here. Brocha v'hatzlocha sh'yamale Hashem kol mishala sleep tam l'tova. Like a zitten zimmer. Yeshuf in Yerushalayim with his older brother. Really? If you can believe that. Really? Yes. When he said older brother, he the beard outside.